Amen. Please remain standing if you're able to for the reading of God's Word this morning. Church online, please consider standing and joining your family here as well. Stand to your feet as we honor His truth and Word together. This morning, let's begin our message by looking at one verse to start with. Then we're going to read most of the chapter together. But this one verse is the essence of the Gospel that Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. Verse 16, it says, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness he was manifested in the flesh vindicated by the spirit seen by angels proclaimed among the nations believed on in the world taken up in glory he was manifested in the flesh vindicated by the spirit seen by angels proclaimed among the nations believed on in the world taken up in glory let's pray together this morning father we worship your holy name in this church we worship who you are and how awesome of a God you are God we praise you that this morning we have the privilege of standing before our Creator and singing songs of praise and proclaiming that you are the way to truth and life and there's none beside you there's no other way other than you thank you for being a path to our redemption and our hope Lord our world needs hope and we need you desperately so Jesus, we come before you today. We ask that for the next few minutes, you would take over the service. The words we read, the passages that we talk about, the concept of leadership that we look at, Jesus, be at the center of this church and let your name, your renown, your glory to be revealed. Jesus Christ, vindicate us as well with your Holy Spirit today. We give this time to you. And we ask you to do with us according to your will today, Jesus. Be magnified in your holy and precious name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone this morning? Good. You guys do much better than the first service, okay? <laughs> hey, guys, before we get started, I want to remind you once more, please, please spend time praying for our teenagers, for our youth as they go to camp. Pray. I, I don't know how to express this, but... They are the future of this world. They are the future of the church. They need all of your prayers. They need you to spend as prayer warriors to fight for them. They need to be able to hear God's truth and transformation. So pray that this week they have a transformative time where they cannot turn back from God. Pray for that. Pray for the leaders, myself and, and a bunch of other people who are just going, who are awesome, who are just going to serve in this way. Pray for them so that they would have energy to deal with these young people as well, okay? Now, this morning we are continuing in our series called Fight the Good Fight, and we're going to talk about choosing the right leaders, but if you have your Bibles, please open up with me to Matthew, um, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter um, 3. We're going we're gonna to be there the whole day, 1 Timothy chapter 3. But before we get started, if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back. If you want to use your cell phones, please and please silence your cell phones. Before we get started, let me, let me start with this. Between 1971 to 1979, Idi Amin ruled as the president, and I say ruled because he was more like a king, ruled as the president of the country of Uganda in Africa. This man was such a wicked and brutal man that during the time of his presidency, he was responsible, he's known to be responsible for the death of over 300,000 civilians. He was a wicked and evil man, and in this eight years that he sat on the president's throne, he, he was also against Christianity. He persecuted the Christians, he hated the Christianity, he didn't want the name of Jesus to be proclaimed, and despite all the abuse and the persecution, and despite all the crazy things that he had done to stop Christianity, on Easter Sunday of 1973, a young pastor named Kefa Sempangi, you may have heard of him, Kefa Sempangi stood before 7,000 people in the stadium of his town and he preached the gospel on Easter Sunday to 7,000 people. He preached about the death, the resurrection of Jesus and the victory of Jesus despite the persecution around him. After the sermon, after the service, he went back to his church and he was followed by five of the secret service agents of President um, Amin's um, President Amin's Secret Service. They followed him into the church. They shut the door behind themselves, and before he knew it, he had five rifles pointing at his face. And the captain of the soldiers looked at him and said, "You are going to die today." 
you are going to die today if you have any last words this is your chance to speak your last words and according to his own words pastor sampangi said that according to his words he was terrified at that moment and trembling in fear thinking of his wife thinking of his young daughter that he was going to leave behind but he said then he remembered the words of the sermon that he had preached to people about the resurrection of our savior the victory that comes from him and he said he found courage and he spoke these words i want to read it for you guys he said to the five men pointing a rifle at his face he said do what you must the word of god says that i am in that the word of god says that in christ i am already dead and that my real life is hidden with him in god it is not my life that is in danger but yours i am alive in the risen lord but you are still dead in your sins may he spare you from eternal destruction so he boldly looked at these five soldiers and said these words and he said that there was suspense in the room for a long long time and no noise nothing as the time froze and after a long long time the captain of the soldiers lowered his gun and he said pastor would you pray for us and in that moment the five accusers and the oppressors of the faith became the protectors of the christian faith now why do i share this with you because if one man has the potential to stand up for the truth if one man has the potential to allow the spirit of the living god that lives inside of him to stand and courageously to preach not only before seven thousand people but at the point of death even to stand and say here's the truth i am alive in jesus but i pray for you what kind of a difference would it make if every single soul in this room took this matter seriously what kind of a difference would it make if you and I saw that, hey, if one man has the potential to change five people's lives forever, what kind of a difference would it make if five people stood up, if 10 people stood up, if 50 people stood up? Now, I have to tell you this because I believe this with all of my heart that when Satan appears to be so powerful, I don't know about you guys, but my wife and I have had a hard week this week with so many crazy things going on. And when Satan appears to be all powerful and seems himself or shows himself as this strong entity, he knows and he tries to appear as powerful because he knows that if the spirit of the living God in one person can destroy all his power, what would it look like if an army of the followers of Jesus stood up against him? And I hope this morning you understand the power of the leadership that comes from the Spirit of God to be within you. So as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, there are two dangers, before I read the thing for you guys, there are two dangers that could come to you, and I want to make sure I state them to you beforehand, okay? So we, we jump, into understanding, jump into this understanding the two dangers that are ahead of us. The first danger is that many of you have heard pastors preach on 1 Timothy chapter 3 about the role of the elders and the pastors and things like that in the church, which is very relevant and important. However, the danger is that many of you are going to read this passage or have read it, and you have said to yourself, well, I'm not a leader. It doesn't apply to me. This passage was not written for me, but Pastor Guy, it was written for you. This passage does not really work on me. It's not for me. It's for you guys. Now, here's the thing. If that's the way you think, if you think you are not a leader, let me tell you something very boldly. You are wrong. Because if you claim to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then in Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus gave this command, said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gave a command to his followers to become what? Leaders. So if you are a disciple, you are by nature a leader, whether you like it or not. If you are a follower of Jesus, by nature you are a leader, and therefore these verses really apply to you. Now, the second danger that we will face is some of you are going to read the qualifications of these leaders and you're going to think to yourself of the leaders that have been above you or the leaders that you are under right now and you're going to look at them with resentment you're going to think less of them instead of spending time to pray for them instead of thinking about them of how you can build these leaders up don't do that today what i want you to do is to examine your own hearts to see where god wants you to be as a leader not anybody else is everybody still with me yes. are you sure yes. okay because what I want to do I want to read 13 verses back to back I need your full attention and here's the thing I am going to read this even if my sermon 
is horrible, even if nothing is good, this is the Word of God. I don't even have to preach. This is good enough on its own, okay? So I need your full attention. Do I have your full attention as I read these verses for you guys? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's people, God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy, nor dishonest gain. For dishonest gain, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their, their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, There's a lot of verses we just read, and I realize some of you have maybe wandered somewhere else and you started daydreaming about something else. But these verses are so important. There's a lot of qualifications here given for what a leader should look like. For somebody who's supposed to lead a group of people, a church, the people of God perhaps. Now what I want to do we're going to come back to these, some of these verses, but I want to start with verse 1, and we're going to spend a, a, quite a bit of chunk of time on verse 1, because verse 1 is so significant. Now, look at this. It says, if you're, by the way, if you don't mind underlining your Bible, I'm going to give you two words to underline. If, if you don't like to do that, just remember these two words, okay? Verse 1 says, the saying is trustworthy. The saying is trustworthy. If anybody aspires, underline the word aspire, to the office of overseer, underline that. He desires a noble task. If anybody aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So let's get a few uh, word things out of the way first, okay? The first thing I want you to understand is the word overseer. Some of your translations say bishop. Some of them may say just church leader. The word overseer comes from the Greek word episcopus, okay? The word episcopus, formally, it means bishop or overseer. However, it is synonymous with the word pastor, elder, bishop, overseer, or church leadership in general. Now, what is significant about this word is that in the, in the Scripture, now you can do your own research on this. I am merely stating the fact, okay? In the Scripture, this word only has a male connotation attached to it, okay? Only male connotation attached to it. Now, I realize people come from different backgrounds and theologies. That my aim is not to talk about that. I'm just telling you the definition of the word, okay? Now, there is the second word, however, called deacons, okay? Deacons. The word deacon literally translates to servant, now this word, literal, literal definition of deacon is servant. Now this word has been used in the scripture, not necessarily in Timothy, but it has been used in the scripture for both male and female. In fact, in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, you can read it on your own. Romans chapter 16, verse 1, you see that a, a lady is called a deacon. Now what I want you to see out of this is the word deacon in particular, okay, which means servant, isn't it interesting to you that one of the key leadership positions in the church translates to servant? Think about that for a second. Isn't it fascinating that key leadership position in the church translates to somebody who serves, not somebody who is worshipped, not somebody who is so admired and so above and or feared, somebody who is a servant. Now, I realize also that some of you are sitting here say, well, well, hold on a second, but I don't even know what kind of a leader. I'm not a leader in the church. I'm not a leader in anything. I have a few questions for you, okay? Raise your hands and keep them up. Don't bring them down if any of these apply to you. Are you a parent? Raise your hand. Are you a grandparent? Here, raise your hand, okay? Are you, a, are you an older sibling? Raise your hand. Okay, are you a disciple of Jesus? Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you can for a second. Now, look around for a second. Now, who is a leader in this place? You can put your hands down. Almost everybody is a leader. Now, if you're a young person, say, well, none of these apply to me, you are going to be a leader 
at some point. If you're an employee, you're going to lead at some aspects of life. If you're a boss, you are a leader. Now, do these verses apply to just church leadership? I don't think so. I think if these principles are taken seriously, all of them apply to everybody. But what is so important says, if anybody, verse 1 says, if anybody aspires to the office of overseer or leadership, aspiration, there is this desire. And I don't know if there's a single person I've ever met in my life who does not have some sort of aspirations for something. In fact, it is a rare commodity if I stand before you today and say, hey, um, whoever you are, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a higher position. He would say, no, 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 I would refuse that. It's a rare thing if I stand before you and say, hey, I'm going to give you $3 million today so that you could live a rich and wealthy life. You would be like, no, thank you. I don't want to be rich. It's a rare thing. It almost doesn't ever happen because every single person in this room has aspirations for greatness. Every single person aspires to be great in one way or another. And the reason we have the aspiration for greatness is not because we, we are necessarily evil. It's because we were created by the greatest entity in the world and we were created in His image. But we have to come to realize that our greatness does not come from ourselves. It comes from Him who is all great. Now, what is so amazing though, He says, if anybody has the aspiration for the office of leadership, that's a noble desire. However, he, here's the scary thing. Are you guys ready for this? Okay. You know what? You're not ready. I'll preach on this next week. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll go to something else this morning. Are you guys ready for this or not? Yeah. <laughs> Here's the scary thing. Aspirations can come from two sources. The first one can be God. The second scary version is, could come from the devil. And the very notion that your aspirations can come from two different sources should give you a high, high, high thing, desire to want to test where your aspirations come from. And I want you to write this down if you're a note taker. Take a picture of the screen. Ask yourself this question, what source does my aspiration originate from? What is the source of my aspiration? Because it doesn't matter who you are, whether it's your sinful nature, whether it's the demons at work, whether it's the powers of Satan, for some of us, we will be influenced by the powers of hell to seek aspirations that are not from God and to seek things, powers, and authorities to become leaders that are not godly. In fact, history tells us about Pope Sergius III. Some of you may have studied about him or heard about him. Pope Sergius III sat on the papal throne in the ninth century. And I say papal throne, he was supposed to be a spiritual leader, but history tells us that he brutally ordered the murder of two of his predecessors. He killed the two popes before himself to be sit and be the pope and the spiritual leader of people. Now let me ask you this, does that, does that aspiration come from God? See, aspirations can come from two sources, either God or people. However, if these aspirations come from God, then they follow certain principles that are attached to them. And those principles are found right here in Timothy. So verse 1 again, it says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. However, right, however, therefore an overseer, a leader must be above reproach. He must be different than everybody else. He must be seen as, as better than everybody else. He must be above reproach. He must be the husband of one wife. Let, let me pause right here for a second. Some of you say, well, I'm a woman, so I can't be a husband of one wife. That doesn't apply to me. The idea is sexual immorality, okay? Now, for the time of Timothy, this was something that the, the, the male leadership was dealing with. Now, for us, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you need to be sexually pure, okay? It needs to be a husband of one wife, sober-minded, so he's not always thinking about everything else, but he's sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. In other words, you should never look at a leader who always wants to fight with somebody. That's not a leader. That's somebody who is looking to cause trouble. Leaders are peacemakers. Not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household well, how will he care for, the church, for God's church? If a leader cannot take care of his family, how is that person going to take care of the people? Such simple principles. He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. In other words, this person needs to have a good reputation. 
other people outside the church inside the church everywhere he goes people need to think of him as a person of peace as a person of love now i don't know if you realize this or not but the qualities of a leader all of them point to one thing i don't know if you notice this but all of these are aspects of servanthood all of these are things that lead the person to be a servant a true leader this is the simplest thing i'm giving you so simple true leaders are servants True leaders think of everybody else before they think about themselves. If you want to drink, you always think, what if there's a person who is dealing with addiction and I am becoming a stumbling block for them? If you're having sexual thoughts, you don't look at people as objects, you look at them as children of the living God. You look at people as to how you could always serve them. And I realize this is not where our culture is. I realize that in our culture, leadership means an empire. Look at our government's systems, not just America. I'm talking about the governments of the world. Everybody's trying to build an empire. Look at our corporate system. They're always thinking of building an empire. This is not the essence of leadership that we are taught. Because this essence of leadership, this essence is difficult. Because no leader wants to think themselves as servants. No leader wants to be, we want to be served as we get to a position of authority and leadership. And I realize some of you are still thinking, well, that's a good thing I'm not a leader. If you're a disciple, are you a leader then? If you're a disciple, aren't you called to bring people to follow the greatest leader? So naturally, you're a leader. Now, if you're a disciple, then are you a servant? Are you spending your time, your resources to serve other people, to, to teach them or think? In other words, if you are a leader, everything about you manifests who God is, not who you are. Is everybody still with me? Yes. Now, what is also interesting, though, true leaders are servants. Matthew 20, verse 26 says, but whoever would be great among you must be your, what is the word right there? Must be what? If you want to be great, you got to be servant? How does that even work? I mean, in our culture, we are taught greatness comes with authority and power and how I have an empire. So if you want to be great, you have to be a servant. And I was really thinking about this because as a pastor, I get often, people oftentimes come to me and say, uh, Mr. Pastor Guy, I am qualified for these positions. I have education for this. I am very good at this. I am awesome at this. I am a best, I could be the best elder. I could be the best teacher. I could be this. And let me give you a number one rule that I have. If you tell me how qualified you are, that means you're totally not qualified. Okay? So here's the thing. If you come to me and says, hey, I ha I, you say, I am qualified for this, know this. You will never get that title. But if you want a title from me, if you want me to honor you with a title, work yourself into that title. I want you to notice this because our elders in this church, they are servants. All of them, you don't even know many of you. You have no clue. They are serving all the time behind the scenes. They are lowering themselves to the lowest levels to serve you. They're constantly giving to you in different ways. Our, our leadership, our pastoral stuff, they're constantly serving in this church. They don't care about how much it hurts them at times. Because true leaders are servants. True leaders are servants and they prove themselves. That's why look at this, verse 10, it says, and, and let them, if they want to be deacons, if they want to be leaders, let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves to be blameless. When was the last time we elected a president and said, let them prove that he's a good president? When was the last time we did that? Now, in our culture, if anybody has some sort of say or can, can, can be loudest, who can, be, uh, who can talk about him the best, is the, is the one who is elected. Anybody who is more of a celebrity can be elected. When was the last time we said, you know what, we want to give you this opportunity to prove that you could be a great president or a leader for us. We want to give you this opportunity to say, hey, you would be a great boss for this corporation. Imagine what would take place if we applied these principles to our governments, to our authorities the world around us would change. Well, these are things that are scary, so we don't do them because, again, there's this aspiration within us for greatness ourselves, and we cannot. We cannot become servants unless God really does something in our hearts. And I was really, as I was preparing for this message, I was reading through 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I was looking at another story in the Bible. In John chapter 13, there is this story you can read it on your own. I'm going to tell you how it goes, but you can read it on your own later. In John chapter 13, there's a story of a leader of leaders, the teacher of teachers. 
the pastor of pastors, the bishop of bishops. If you don't know who I'm talking about, his name is Jesus, okay? This, this passage that describes this leader of leaders who is gathered in the house with the disciples and they're eating a meal together. And at the meal time, after the meal time, suddenly he gets up, Jesus, the leader of leaders, gets up and strips himself and puts a towel around his waist and he bends down and he starts washing the feet of the disciples. That was the job of slaves. To lower yourself to that level, that was unimaginable in the culture. And yet he starts washing the feet of his disciples and he, the disciples are confused because they had gathered in that room thinking, how could we serve him? And then here he is washing their feet. And he washes the feet of the disciples and he gets to Peter, which, which always has to say something, okay? He gets to Peter and Peter says, hold on, hold on, what are you doing, Jesus? You can't wash my feet. I can't allow you to do that. And Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. And it hit me as I was reading it. It hit me as I was reading that, as I was hitting, what, reading what 1 Timothy says, that true leaders, if you're a note taker, this is so significant. True leaders are like elevators, I realized he's like, what in the world does that even mean? But think about it for a second. True leaders are like elevators. They go up and down based on the level and the need of their people. They go up and down. Sometimes they have to bring people down to a lower level. Sometimes they have to take them up. But true leaders never stay in one level forever. They always come to meet the needs of their people. That's what true leadership is all about. That's what you are called to be. You become like elevators. As in, if you are a parent, you understand this the best because there were times you had to change diapers. I said, this is a low-level job. But you brought yourself to that level because it needed to be done. Now, if you're a boss, you need to think like that too. You come down to the level of your people so that they could be elevated up the whole point of an elevator is to take people to where they need to go and if you're an elevator leader that's how you think you don't think about where you are going to be you think about where people need to be everything about you thinks about others to serve others and that is who Jesus was See, he lowered himself to the level of washing the feet of his disciples because said unless I do this you will have no part in me because you will never understand that true leaders need to lower themselves and take people up with themselves. Let me ask you this. And I don't want you to give me an answer on this out loud. I just want you to think about this. But let me ask you this. Think about the world we are in. Are our leaders as government leaders, are they elevator leaders? Think about this for a second. Are the leaders of the churches that you attend to, are they elevator leaders? Are they going up and down? Because if they're not, they're not following the principles of the scripture. And the thing is, you and I have chosen them to be those leaders. Now think about yourself for a second. Are you an elevator leader? Are you a servant leader who is constantly thinking about how could I elevate people to a higher level? How could I help them be the people that God has created them to be? Ask yourself that question. And the point of this is not to create guilt within us, but to examine our own hearts to see where we are. Now, I think the reason Apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy, and in chapter 3 in particular, you see that the concept of leadership is kind of concluded with verse 16. Would you go to that? Would you put verse 16 up on the screen? Cover my face real quick. I want you to look at this verse for a second. The whole essence of a leader is found in the principle of the gospel. The whole essence of a leader is found in what the gospel is. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. That Jesus was manifested himself in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. He manifested himself in the flesh. He lowered himself to the lowest point for God to be. He was vindicated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, he had to carry the sins of humanity on his shoulders. And then he was seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is the essence and the heart of a leader, the gospel. 
true leaders are always thinking about the gospel. So you have to ask yourself, is gospel, the gospel really what makes your heart beat? When you look at other people, are you thinking about how they can serve you or are you thinking about how you can serve them? Remember the story I started with about Pastor Kefa Sampangi? He has the guns pointed at his face, five guns, and in that moment, he thinks, how can I serve these people? And if one man has the potential to lead five people to Christ, what would it look like if you, 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 all of you took this seriously and began to actually serve, not to be served, began to be the leaders that God has called you to be? What kind of a difference would it make? Would five turn into 50? Would 50 turn into 5,000? Would 5,000 turn into 5 million? Would this world look different? I don't know if you understand the depth of this. But you were called to be leaders. Not in the worldly sense. Not in the worldly sense. But servants. People who proclaim the gospel wherever you are. And I hope you will take that seriously. I'm going to ask the prayer team members to surround the room. If you're in a place in your life where you have people right now above you that are driving you crazy, come pray with somebody for them. Come pray for them. If you're in a place in your life where you are a leader who is driving everybody else crazy, come pray. If you're in a place in your life where you just need, you just need to talk to Jesus and you just don't know how to do it, come pray with somebody. Come find me afterward, pray with me. I want to finish today by reading this passage that talks about the greatest leader of all times. Would you mind standing up for this if you're able to? And allow these words to speak to your hearts. Greatest leader of all times. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, have this mind among yourselves. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let this be the way you think about leadership. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The creator of the heavens and the earth lowered himself to the lowest point so that he could elevate you to the highest point. And that is a real leader. That is the leader you're called to be. If the Spirit of God leads you to come and kneel before him up here or kneel at your seats, if the Spirit of God leads you to just bow your heads or raise your hands, Lord, I thank you so much. Father, I thank you that we can understand today from your word that leadership is not what this world teaches us. That leadership is not about what I want or what I can get, but it's about what I can do to serve you and the people. And the truth of the matter is, Lord, none of us are qualified. None of us are equipped by the blood of Jesus the Holy Spirit within us is what gives us the qualifications. It is your name that gives us the authority and the power to lead. But as we lead in your name, Lord, help us to leave as, lead as servants. Help us to lead with the authority of Jesus Christ in our hearts, knowing and standing for the truth. This world needs hope. It is broken, it is lost, and it needs your hope. Lord Jesus, please, and it's still in us a desire, the aspirations that come from you to lead the people to fall before you and to proclaim as every tongue will one day and as every knee will bow one day that we would proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord before it's too late. Holy Spirit, please fill our hearts with mighty, with your mighty power. That wherever we go, we are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. That the world around us would know that we are indeed vindicated by the Holy Spirit. 
that we are indeed redeemed by your power that on our own we were nobodies and nothing but you have given us a title you have given us the authority as the children of God as the co-heirs of the kingdom of the living God thank you that you have chosen us to be your people and that you have called us to be leaders may we take these words seriously may we go and make disciples of all nations leading them to be baptized in your name father son holy spirit jesus we worship you thank you for giving yourself on the cross for us thank you for being the sacrifice for our sins may you be glorified in the name of our savior jesus christ i pray